Good morning, everybody. This is John Selleck, and welcome to the Empowering Survivors webinar. We're going to be giving an update today on the status of the legislative package that we introduced first back in September. Uh, some of you were with us at a press conference at the Capitol. Today, we're going to have four people uh, on the webinar to discuss various uh, angles to both the legislation and to the issue uh, as a whole. First, we'll have the bill's sponsors, Representative Ryan Berman from Oakland County, and then Representative Karen Witsett, a Democrat from Wayne County. It's a bipartisan uh, set of legislation. Following that, we'll have uh, Professor Amos Guerra. He's on the law school faculty at the University of Utah, but grew up in Ann Arbor and is the author of a book that was just published called Armies of Enablers, in which he did interviews with survivors on college campuses such as Michigan State, uh, Penn State, and the Catholic Church. And he'll be joined up with his tag team partner with John Vaughn. If you were at the press conference in September, you'll remember that John spoke there. Um, he's a survivor of Dr. Robert Anderson at U of M. He was a running back on the football team under Bo Schembechler, and now he is an activist on behalf of the survivor community and, and their uh, efforts to achieve justice. Thank you, John. Thanks, uh, everybody, for being here, tuning in to uh, this update on the Empowering Survivors package. Uh, I've been fortunate to being able to lead this initiative uh, that is so very much needed uh, and working with uh, my fellow legislators on this. Um, we introduced this package and it's uh, you know, a package of just of two bills that do two main things. And, and luckily it's a bipartisan and we have a good group of uh, legislators supporting this, uh, both Republicans and Democrats. It's is one of those issues that you see that isn't a partisan slant. Uh, I think that everybody can get behind and it's not political. Uh, it's for seeking justice and doing the right thing. And with that, uh, myself, Republican, Representative Maddock, Representative Paquette, uh, Representative Garrett, Representative Peterson, Representative Rendon, Representative Wenzel, Representative Byrd, uh, of course, Representative Whitsett, who's on here today, uh, along with Representative Yancey, Mueller, Aller, uh, have all signed on. Over about 10% of, uh, of legislators here in the state of Michigan uh, that saw this, this bill, saw this wrong, and decided to stand up and get behind this. And to reiterate, this, uh, these bills were, were put in September, and what they do is two things. Uh, uh, number is H House Bill 6238 and 6237. And House Bill 6237 uh, reforms our governmental immunity laws, and which has been enabled these institutions, uh, whether it's any type of governmental agency unit um, and what we're seeing it with, and especially here, is with our public universities. And they are able right now to hide behind our state's governmental immunity laws to shield themselves from any type of liability in the course of their conduct um, from tort claims. Torts are a wrong that is uh, put on to somebody is what our, our law calls torts. And what this bill does is it would curtail the use of immunity when uh, in specifically in these instances where abuse occurred under the guise of medical care and the school knew or should have known uh, this abuse was occurring and they failed to uh, prevent it. They failed to, they just stood by and kind of turned turn their back, turned a blind eye on it. And you know, that, that's wrong and it shouldn't happen. And we're going to go into that in, in this webinar a little bit with our, our, some of our speakers and why it's so important. And just uh, amending our law, changing it is, you know, that for, first very important step. So this kind of abuse, this kind of conduct doesn't happen again and uh, to prevent that. But the next bill, uh, specifically looking where the first bill looks looks forward and the next bill actually looks backward saying this is how the law should have been and it opens up a uh, statute of limitations a retroactive window so people who have been wronged in the past have uh, time to now bring their claims forward go into court and and seek the justice 
uh, in a court of law and to pursue those available legal remedies. So the, these bills are very important, you know, moving forward in this sphere. And what we've seen in, in the impetus, obviously, is it's focused now uh, from the newspapers and what's happening from the Dr. Robert Anderson scandal at University of Michigan. We already saw reforms in our law from the Larry Nasser scandal at University uh, of Michigan State University. And, um, you know, I just think it's, it's very important moving forward. And that's why I put on this to do everything we can to help empower survivors. Due to other events <laughs> that have transpired this year, mainly uh, the pandemic and COVID-19 that has uh, really dominated not only the headlines, but all our lives, uh, it really pushed our schedule back in the legislature. It pushed it back uh, and not only did we not have uh, the ability to meet at certain points this year, uh, and we had to take every improper precautions, uh, it really delayed uh, looking at new bills and really looking at anything that was not COVID related and not you know, of, of utmost uh, forefront of concern. Um, with that, while this legislative session uh, is uh, gonna be ending next week, and there hasn't time to set up uh, hearings on these bills and, and moving these forwards in this legislative session. Luckily, uh, I will be back next term starting in January as well as Rep Witset. And I'm committed to seeing these, these bills and reintroducing them uh, uh, in January when the 101st legislature uh, takes uh, is seated on January 13th. Uh, the new term starts, and then this, these bills will have that next two-year legislative cycle to move through uh, the process, and hopefully it won't take two years uh, to get through and, and work on these bills to, to make it become law. So this update mainly, and we're going to go through, it's, it's today is to reassure the survivors reassure uh, stakeholders, reassure people that want to see good policy in our state that these bills are going to be reintroduced. Uh, Rep. Uh, Whitsett, who's gonna be on with us today, uh, is, is committed to working uh, with me on these bills, uh, as well as uh, many other representatives who, who signed on, whether they're gonna be here in the next term or not, we're gonna have new, new members and uh, looking forward to, and after these bills were submitted, I had other representatives that weren't aware uh, necessarily get, got the memo coming to me committed to helping with this process and doing what they can uh, moving forward to, to help this become law. So I, I think, uh, I think it's, it's very positive and uh, considering all the steps that were that were taken uh, to get to this point and where we're at now, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great and I think we're on the right trajectory. With that today, uh, I would like to uh, introduce, we have uh, our, our guests who have already uh, announced, we have uh, Rep. Karen Whitsett, we have uh, former U of M football player, John Vaughn, who was with us at the introduction of this package in September. Um, and we had others who, who couldn't be here today on this, uh, but I would like to thank uh, Tad DeLuca, John Lott, and, and others for coming forward and, and helping on this so far. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to introduce Rep. Karen Whitsett from uh, Detroit's 9th District uh, to say a few words. Thank you for having me. Um, as my colleague has so eloquently put it, this work is imperative and, you know, it comes from my personal experience. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate, not just because of for myself personally, but because of what has transpired for so many years. This has just been part of our culture and we thought that it's okay. Not us personally, but the powers that be thought that this was okay and it's not okay. 
And this bill that I'm sponsoring is so important that we give that retroactiveness that is necessary because you're traumatized. You are absolutely traumatized. How are you supposed to make a decision in a short amount of time on something that you've gone through that has hurt you, that has devastated you, that has forever changed your life? There's so much that comes with it from the hurt, the pain, the questions, the embarrassment, um, the anger, the outrage, and then trying to get people to believe you. The disbelief is unsurmountable. So for myself personally, one of the experiences that I've had, because once you become victimized, unfortunately, you seem to become a victim more than once. It's not just a one-time thing. And for me to have the personal experience of having a doctor for me to, to fondle me, to insert his fingers inside of me with no gloves on, with someone in the room, with a nurse's assistant in the room. And what was shocking to me is that this was another black woman. And it mattered to me that this was, and that I wondered why this person was taking so long to do my exam. And I looked at her because I'm waiting for the glove to snap and there was no snap of a glove. Can you imagine at your early 20s that this is the experience that you're having or at any age, but this is the experience that you're having. And the very first things that this person said to me is that I had an STD. He said that to keep me quiet, to keep me quiet. So of course I was scared, I was embarrassed, I was traumatized, I didn't tell anyone but people need to know that it's safe to come to someone, that there's a recourse, that you have actions and that someone needs to be held accountable and that you do not have some unrealistic timeline in which to report these matters in. And that's what we're trying to do today with my colleague. We are trying to ensure that victims are no longer victimized, that they cannot be tortured and tormented mentally and physically. One time is one time too many. And that's the work that we're trying to do. And I'm dedicated, I'm determined. I'm probably more determined than last term to be able to get this done and to see this through over the finish line because we have a lot of people that are counting on us. And when my colleague brought this to me, I was on board 100%. He didn't have to ask me twice. And that is still stands today. I'm probably more enthused about getting this done because in this day and age, when COVID is going along, so many issues like this are being pushed to the side and my colleague and I are not going to be deterred by that. We are not going to let this, this be brushed under the carpet just because COVID is going on. It still doesn't stop victims from being victimized. It probably makes it more rampant than ever before. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. I'm here in full support. I'm 100% on board and I'm not letting up full throttle ahead. Thank you, Representative. And, you know, it, it shows wow. how strong and courageous and, and what it takes that we, you know, and we have people on today that I'm going to introduce right now, former U of M football player, John Vaughn, that is courageous enough to stand up. And like Representative Witts had said, it, you know, we need to know, and that's what having their backs, that they're not alone. And when Representative Witts said, you know, agreed to go on this bill package. And I worked with her on other bills in the past. I didn't know about her history. I didn't know that this was personal to her. And having that, that connection, having that, you know, personal um, uh, interest in this legislation. And like she said, she's, she's deeply committed to this even more so, you know, and, and it has that uh, impetus to see it through to make sure this becomes, because it's it's not just an abstract concept, it, it's personal and we need good policy. And it just, you know, reiterates that that decision and having Karen, I'm sorry, Rep Whitsett on this package, you know, to, to, to lend her voice to this, to lend her experiences showing that, you know, these, these I wanna say survivors are, are not alone. And it takes just one person, one courageous person to speak up. And that's what we saw. And then you see it's, you're not alone. It wasn't just you. There's another one and another one. So with that and, and talking about the importance of it, we have former U of M football player, John Vaughn, 
and law professor from the University of Utah Law School, uh, Amos Guerra on today. And I'd like to introduce them about uh, their work. And like I said, having one person stand up, I think that's how uh, Amos got introduced to John. And let's hear what you guys uh, are, are working on or have to say about this. So, um, uh, John, can I go ahead? No, go. Yeah, go ahead. So, right. um, good afternoon, good morning to all of you, Representative Berman, Representative Whitsett. Thank you for having um, me on um, this most important conversation. To introduce myself, as John mentioned in the um, introduction, I grew up in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor, my father taught at Michigan, and if there's somebody who is true blue all in, it's me. Um, I need to say that in full disclosure. I also need to add in full disclosure, I'm actually um, Skyping in from Israel. Um, I commute between Salt Lake and Jerusalem. Um, I served for 20 years in the Israel Defense Forces where I was actively involved in operational counterterrorism. And then I came to American Academia and for the last seven or so, year, seven or so years, I've been involved in my, through my scholarship in a, creating a triangle of complicity, the bystander and the enabler. A number of years ago, I wrote a book called The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander in the Holocaust, which is about my parents who are both Holocaust survivors. And that book led to a book that came out in September called Armies of Enablers, which is about survivor stories. Over the course of 15 months, I interviewed 20 to 25 sexual assault survivors from Michigan State, Ohio State, Catholic Church, USA Gymnastics. And what is of great importance for me is exactly as Representative Woodset emphasizes, it's not the crime, but what the perpetrator does, it's the enabler. And that's why I think both Representatives Berman and Woodset are absolutely spot on correct in terms of their legislation. The survivors who I interviewed for actually for both books don't really feel anger at the perpetrator. The anger, the, the, the rage, if I may use that word, is directed at the enabler and or the bystander. I define the bystander as the person who's in the room or sees the person in peril, sees the assault. The enabler is the person who knows or could have prevented. And in looking at Michigan State University and Larry Nassar, their enablers left, right, and center. The same thing with Michigan State, the same thing with Ohio State. And that's why for me, as the one who, if I may speak frankly, who has created this triangle of complicity, bystander, and enabler, it is for me of great importance to be as involved as involved can be um, to ensure that exactly as Representative Woodset points out, as we're having this conversation, who knows how many other people are being assaulted? I mean, that's the grim reality. We all know the statistics, whether it's women being assaulted or men being assaulted. We'll talk about John in a second. But both victims, both categories of victims absolutely need our protection. In the Armies of Enablers book, I asked one question of those who I interviewed. What were your expectations of the enabler? Their answer was clear. Their expect expectation was to be protected. And then the follow-up question is obviously, and, and the overwhelming response I got was that the enabler abandoned them. As a, as a law professor, I absolutely agree with Representative Vermin. We can't just say, oh gosh, you know, the enabler, we need to go after them. And if we don't go after them hard, then the enabler will continue enabling. It's perhaps easy to be an enabler to turn your head just like it is with a bystander. For me, I'm absolutely committed to this notion of criminalizing the enabler and or bystander. Because I think otherwise what we saw at Michigan State and now frankly, as John Vaughn will speak in a second, as we now know at the University of Michigan, that same theme of enablers, is what I refer to in the book as the culture of enabling. And it is that culture of enabling that absolutely demands our attention. As it, and, the and the title of the book, Armies of Enablers, is absolutely essential for all of you to understand. It's not an enabler, it's armies of enablers. I need to also add that title didn't come from me. It came from one of the women who I interviewed who um, was a gymnast at Michigan State who told me um, it's not an enabler, it's armies. And that theme has really stuck with me. And hence, um, the book is entitled Armies of Enablers. And one more point, you have to understand that from the perspective of the person um, in peril, the enabler is not passive. Um, one of the women who's also a Michigan, another Michigan State athlete who I spent hours with her, um, for her, the enabler was, was an active participant. 
not in the room, but an absolute active participant. It's not passive. And you know, we sometimes say, well, the bystander, the enabler, we need to stop with that. We absolutely must understand that the enabler and the bystander are both active participants. And if we allow them to quote unquote, get away with it, wherever they may be, then what happened to our representative Woodset, what happened to John Vaughn um, and all the other Anderson victims, all the other Nasser victims, who the hell knows where that ex is happening exactly today? And as I told Representative Berman when we spoke the other day, wherever I am, I say this also to Representative Woodson, wherever I am, count me in. Because as the one who wrote the book, as the one who's interviewed all these people, um, I'm all in. And we cannot allow ourselves the luxury of saying it's only the perp. Frankly speaking, if not for the enabler and or bystander, there's no perp. That's the reality. Um, John Vaughn, I turn it over to you. Uh, Juan, I just um, thank you guys uh, for inviting me to be a part of this today and um, just in support of these bills. The one thing that really brought me, I guess, to today is the biggest thing that I feel um, as being a part of this is so often are the victims, survivors, those um, you don't see their faces. And I think that that not only dehumanizes you after the fact, because you had to be dehumanized during the act. And um, it's my goal to um, my, since March, I've heard from so many either ex-teammates or guys that have played in Michigan and started talking to other victims at other, you know, th these, uh, insidious events the biggest thing they felt while all this was going on is that they had no voice um uh, that they almost didn't exist uh to the university or to the organization it's about all the victims um and how that our voices can echo through the halls of legislature uh, when you're presenting these bills so that people know that behind those numbers um and, and you know we're, we're we're at a point in time where we will no longer be silent, that we will no longer be anonymous. Uh, which brings me since Amos and I have gotten to know each other, and he's really helped me understand the um, almost you know all the structures that went into enabling Dr. Anderson for. You know, I'm 50 years old now for, you know, basically my life. Um, and his tenure before in that University of Michigan is, I would love to come together with you. And it's a conversation I had about coming together and really piercing the veil and going behind the scenes where you can see not only from a victim's point of view of all of these armies that enabled one individual to perpetrate this many incidents and steal the joy out of so many young men and women throughout the last 50 years. So I'm, I'm committed to um, being that squeaky wheel, if you will, you know, I'm here um, I won't be silenced um, to isolate myself in the next two months um, to work on the book that Amos and I feel is so critical uh, to be an active participant in whatever form of justice uh, needs to be served, but, but also just uh, really celebrate uh, that you and we are no longer victims, we are survivors. Representative Berman, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, and as John just shared, we indeed are writing a book. And the book is tentatively entitled Piercing the Veil. And we, we indeed intend to do just that, pierce the veil. But I also think, again, I say this both to both Representative Berman and Representative Woodset, had your legislation, which I'm all in on, had it been around you know, back in the day, then I think that the, the enabling culture, which is what exactly enabled Anderson, just like it enabled Nasser, um, would not have 
occurred. And if it would have occurred, there would have been consequences for the enabler. And if the reason that I am so committed to working with the two of you and other um, distinguished members of the Michigan legislature is because um, if we don't ad address it in the way you're both of your suggestion, whether proactively or reactively or both, then that culture is gonna continue unabated. And um, that's, why I'm, that's why it's so important for me to be involved with both of you on the legislative front and frankly, why it's so important for uh, Vaughn and I to write this book. Um, yes, Vaughn will tell his personal story in terms of Anderson, but there's obviously a larger theme that we're addressing in the book, and that is head on dressing, tackling, if you will, um, the enabler culture. And, I, and for me, and I say this to both of you, the, the legislation, I think, will address this, um, and the sooner, the better. No, absolutely. It's with any issue, it's bringing attention to it. It's bringing that attention and then awareness. And it will maybe make somebody in that situation stop and think twice. It'll make somebody that enabler or bystander, you know, more conscientious of what's going on. Or also give them that courage to speak up because that's what's happening here is these survivors having that courage. John makes, uh, you know, a great point of him not just wanting to be a name, not be seen, have a voice. People just don't want to be another statistic. It takes that courageous individual to stand up, be seen, to bring attention to these matters, like we were just discussing. But also, when you're talking about legislation, when you're talking about these themes, and whether it's legislation or just for the media, um, you know, bringing that emotion uh, out of it. You know, there's two things: there's logic and emotion. I didn't have the emotion where Representative Whitset brings that in. And looking at it from just a logical perspective, right, it makes sense. So a lot of people try to manipulate or use emotions, and we you can get into that. That's your whole research and in, in, in there. But um, from me as an attorney, when these bills and with this situation is presented, you know, I, I try to take you know a, a detailed approach and use logic over feelings, and I you know have knee jerk reactions to things. Um, and looking at, at the bill and, and what it really does, and my bill says, you know, when you're talking about this, it makes sense. If a governmental agency, you know, uh, has conduct with involving criminal sexual conduct, and that agency or employee or agent of, of the agency knew or should have known that the individual uh, committed criminal sexual conduct, had committed a prior act of criminal sexual conduct, and that governmental agency or employee failed to act or intervene to prevent subsequent criminal sexual conduct. You know, that's a, a, a burden, a, a bar. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of seems like, uh, you know, common, hey, if you knew that there was prior instances and you just let it continue, like who would do that? So logically to me, hey, this makes sense. And then when you put the, the face behind it, you put the story, you put the emotion, you see how powerful it is in each individual story of why it makes sense. Here's the, if I may say one more thing. Yeah. When, when, when John Vaughn um, was raped by Dr. Anderson in 1988 to 1990, here's the reality. Anderson should not have been on the campus at the University of Michigan. Uh, as we know, it's public record. There's an associate vice president in Michigan who fires um, Anderson. And that decision is, is rescinded, whatever that word means. I mean, Ryan, both you and I are lawyers. Mm. Um, so that word is, is complicated. But the reality is when Vaughn comes to Michigan as a freshman in 1988, Bob Anderson should never have been on campus. That The only reason he's there is because somebody made the decision to allow him to continue to be there and allow him to continue to treat the football, uh, treat, quote unquote, the football players. That's from my perspective, um, not to repeat, but I, I agree with you 100%. It's creating that culture that it that, that enables the, the continued enabling by the enabler, and I mean to call that a wrong is 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 such an is such an understatement, and I think that's exactly why the legislation the two of you are talking about, um, the sooner that this thing gets passed by your distinguished colleagues and and you know in the state of Michigan, the better because that would be the only way to right the wrongs of of, of John Vaughn and 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 you know all the others who were assaulted raped, abused by Anderson. Right. Like, like I said, you know, coming from a, from, from that perspective. And when you have these situations of what should be, what the legislation, what, how our laws should change, 
looking at from a legislator's perspective and saying, hey, said, yes, that makes sense. When you pitch it to our colleagues, yeah, that makes sense. Why if the law's not like that now, you know, and, and does it make sense? I think this thing makes sense. And yeah, we can debate the finer points of whether it's a 90 day window or a one year window with retroactive applications, you know, all right, let's, let's right. get that. But that's what these hearings are for and, and to debate these things. I don't see where somebody could debate against this bill, against the concept of holding people accountable for their actions or inactions in the face of such, uh, you know, terrible acts. But you, Ryan, you as a lawyer also know that an, in, an inaction is also an action. Correct. And let, let me just add in, you know, as my colleague has just said, Rep Berman, that um, we can't see how somebody could debate these issues. Are you able to hear me? Yes, Are absolutely. You, sorry, I've had some technical difference. Difficult. <laughs> no, you're... Well, now we can't hear you. Now you're muted. I, or you, you put the microphone there down. There you go. Sorry. Yeah, there yeah. You go. I'm like, sorry, I've had some technical issues. So yeah. I've had to bop from the computer to my cell phone. Um, as uh, Representative Berman has stated, how can anybody argue these points? I mean, it's apples to oranges. Okay, let's just figure out how we can get this and get this done is mm -hmm. the most important thing. We're talking about human lives. These are real individuals. These are not statistics. They're not numbers. They're real individuals who deserve respect and care and consideration that they haven't gotten in the past because it's taken far too long for this type of legislation to come forward. So to keep comparing it or people wanting to debate it or saying how they can do it better, let's just start with this. It's very simple. Let's just start with this. And then we can have all the other conversations you want after we get this through. That's just the bottom line. Ryan, I think that Vaughn is back with us. Yeah, so John. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> it's amazing we have this technology now. I can't, you can't imagine this again back <laughs> Years years ago, I mean, to, for you to be on and, and seeing you while you're you're driving is a miracle in and of itself. So sometimes we have to put up with some of these uh, the glitches. But with that, is there anything else before before we get to uh, if there's anybody with questions, anything else you would like to uh, get out now, uh, uh, Mr. Vaughn? Well, I think one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about um, since you introduced these bills was um, the statutes and limitations and the, and I think uh, Representative Wissett said, you know, the unrealistic expectations of when you uh, inform someone of these um, uh, events. I hadn't thought about my 30 years of daily life at the university uh, for 30 years. And so once I was made aware, so many things triggered in my mind that almost made it impossible to really think logically about all of the coaches and just taking a very unemotional view of what happened under the guise of meta medical care while we're at the university and all that new uh, that didn't do anything. And, and I think as Amos said, the inactivity was still activity. Um, so I agree with, with, with you all, and especially with Amos that whatever I can do in testifying, um, just being a part of and champion the survivors that we've made it this far um, and being with you guys on the front line to get these bills passed. I'm just committed to that. John, this is John Selleck. If you could just repeat your last few minutes before you broke off last time, because you spoke very powerfully to your upcoming project with uh, Amos. Yes, um, you know, it's either going to be my best decision or worst decision. I am headed up to the UP, um, and I think it's Paradise on um, Lake Superior for the next two months to just isolate myself and right from a perspective where we're, we're given the duality of the enablement as well as from a victim living uh, this tragedy, because I think that it will humanize um, a process that 
a lot of us survivors feel like we were dehumanized in. And that came about uh, just getting to know Amos and looking at the frustration that is had from victims um, continually being portrayed as voiceless and nameless. Um, we, we collaborated and said, wouldn't it be interesting to give a real life accounting of the trauma as well as how that trauma was permitted for so long, case after case after case after case. And I just think that what Amos has to say and, and hopefully uh, my story can be, um, you know, simply put, just pierce the veil and give color to how um, these atrocities can occur for uh, decades long. Thank you. Uh, you know, lo looking forward to that. And, um, you know, with, with that, um, do we have any questions from the uh, attendees watching today uh, about anything that was discussed or the legislation moving forward or to uh, Professor Guerra or uh, myself, Rep Whitset, John Vaughn? Are there any questions? Yes, we're going to have a question from the Detroit News, and I'm going to promote Orlander to the panelist position so she can see you and you can see her and she can ask her question. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, the state representatives, um, uh, Ms. Uh, state Rep Berman had mentioned he's going to reintroduce the bill. Um, could you talk about that? Do you have to reach reintroduce it every session if there's been no action taken? And probably there's been no action taken because of COVID? Yeah, so the way it works is that each uh, legislature, legislature is a legislative session. It's a two-year session. And then it, uh, it adjourns. And once it's adjourned, that means the business in the previous session, no matter where the bills, what, whatever happened there, it's over with and a new legislature, the new legislative session begins. So any bill, whether it had a hearing, it passed the house, I have bills sitting in the Senate. You basically, if it didn't get all the way through, didn't go to the governor's desk, you have to start over basically from scratch. But you know that could be a good thing and a bad thing because of term limits, you have new incoming uh, representatives, maybe you had a bad representative and he gets voted out of office. But you also you get, you know, fresh people, fresh perspectives, and maybe and that's how after 30 years, this past legislative session, we finally got auto no fault insurance uh, reform done in Michigan. That is historic because it couldn't have happened with previous legislate legislate legislatures because of legislators. Um, and now with the new crop, including myself and Rep Whitset, who that was one of her uh, main campaign issues and things that she wanted to change for uh, her district and especially Detroit, we got it done. That's why sometimes if a bill doesn't get through, doesn't even get a hearing in one session, it could be on a fast track the next. Um, sometimes if it passes the House and it's sitting in the Senate, it is an easier chance saying, hey, this just passed three weeks ago, you know, on a, a vote of 104 to, to three, and they say, hey, this is a good idea. It's already been vetted and it gets put on the fast track. So here, because of COVID, because of our schedules, uh, it didn't work out. Uh, the Judiciary Committee and our committee structures, I can go <laughs> bore you with details if you wanna know more of the behind the scenes, but the Judiciary Committee where these were referred to that I'm a member of uh, is a, one of the super committees this year that legislation just gets vetted through one committee and goes onto the floor. Um, we had a lot of bills and because of COVID things weren't brought up, I'm committed again, we'll reintroduce these bills at the beginning of, uh, it's just a couple of weeks now at this point in January. So now they will start be re-referred. We'll have new committee, new committee members, and, and hopefully being able to, uh, see this, uh, sooner rather than later in the legislative term. All right. Thank you very much for that. We have another question from Kate Wells from Michigan Radio, and she'll be appearing on the screen in just a second. Thanks guys, good morning guys. 
Uh, two quick questions. So, Ryan, if I understand this correctly, you're saying that the legislation didn't even get a get a vote within the committee at this point. And then my second sort of follow up question, more broadly here, is you guys have mentioned the similar NASA legislation that this was based on, and during that period of time, we saw MSU lobby pretty hard against broadening that legislation. Have we seen University of Michigan or op any other entity? do any kind of lobbying, even if not sort of out in the forefront to oppose this legislation? So in, in answer of your first question, if we look at the calendar of how many days we actually were in session uh, since September, uh, there was not that many. Uh, and especially when you have uh, a bill as important as this, and when you have uh, many people that wanted to come in and testify, and yeah, we can use Zoom and stuff now, but it's coordinating the things. You need a lead time. And in fact, one of the, the first dates that we were scheduled, if you want to look behind the scenes to actually have a hearing, it ended up, one of those days was we ended up not meeting. So because of logistics, because of the, the schedule and other legislation, the, this bill, these bills were not uh, even uh, scheduled for a hearing yet. Uh, but that's not unusual at all based on of, of logistics. Uh, like I said at the previous question, we're going to have uh, new people. And if there were some people that maybe were opposed to this behind the scenes, they're not going to be there next, next term. Um, as far as anybody lobbying, because it didn't get and it wasn't even at that hearing level yet, typically at those hearings, that's the opportunity for any type of uh, individual or entity to either talk at a hearing in support or in that case of your question against, uh, but they don't even have to talk. They can submit a card of opposition or once it's docketed or scheduled for a hearing, typically that's when people come out and start uh, a buzz around it in different positions. Uh, I wouldn't, I haven't heard uh, directly anybody uh, opposed to this. Uh, indirectly, I'm sure that the University of Michigan would be. Does that answer, or do you have anything else? Yeah, no, that's actually, that's a very helpful explanation. I do have a couple more questions, but I, I wanna be conscious of everybody's time and see if anybody else has questions before I ask a third. Hey, why don't you go ahead with one more question? Yeah, I'm. so my larger question here then is, given this delay, does this, to your knowledge, have any impact on whether guys like John Vaughn can technically go to court at this point? Are they essentially waiting on this legislation? I'm sure they're not waiting to be doing, you know, behind the scenes negotiations through their attorneys with the university, but do they, some of these survivors essentially have to wait for you guys to pass this before they could potentially, you know, go to file a suit or be part of the suit? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a couple facets to, to that question, and you know, mainly people get redressed through through the courts. Yeah, there could be, you know, before that, as an attorney, you know, pre-suit, you know, settlement demands, you know, anybody can file a lawsuit, but then there's defenses. And one of the defenses and the main one here, um, and, and we what we saw at the university, uh, Michigan State University, is that they could have defended based off of statute of limitations, off of government immunity, all these stuff. But when they did, they were kind of crucified, vilified even more in the media. And it was the kind of a public perception. And those settlements uh, weren't necessarily based off of what, you know, strict interpretation of the law. With that said, you know, there's, there's options and seeking remedy and redress. The good thing about this is because of the legislation, whether it got passed in this session, next session, hopefully, or even you know some some bills, some legislation, it takes years and years to finally get through and pass. Um, because it has that retroactive window, when it finally does, it will give those uh, survivors the ability to then go into court and bring their claims uh, because of the retroactive nature. Hopefully, it doesn't happen in you know, five, 10 years from now, but even if it, they have to wait that long and it happens then because of the nature and retroactive uh, ability, then they can go in to court at that point. I don't think, you know, it, it will take that 10 years and I hopefully not. I like to get things done quicker. 
for a bill that was submitted in September and because of COVID and everything that's happening and not to have, you know, cross the finish line two months later is, is really unrealistic expectation if anybody thought it would have been that easy, especially for something that is uh, media attention and controversial such as this. But I'm the type of person that doesn't necessarily take no for an answer. I go through and when I take, put my name on something, I see it through and I'm kind of uh, to, in, you know, intent on pushing it, not just, you know, trying to, I don't like the, the, the spotlight. I'm not looking for to do this Zoom. I'm doing this not for me or put my name on something where other reps may be fine putting their name on a bill and getting some publicity and not caring what happens behind the scenes. I'm doing it because of the policy. Obviously, Rep Whitset is doing it because of the policy. We are committed to making sure that these survivors get the justice that they deserve. We're committed to making sure that this law change gets put in so it doesn't happen again. And if it does happen again, that there's redress for it and there's consequences because that's what our law should be. Ryan, can I jump in for a second? To yes. Ms. Wells, if I may jump in for a second, this is Amos Giora. I think as an add-on to Representative Berman's comments, which I obviously agree with 100%, there are three words that if I take the, my two books together, the Holocaust book and the Armies of Enablers book, that tie, tie into Berman's comments. Three words are responsibility, accountability, and transparency. And whether that's Michigan State or um, University of Michigan, it's absolutely essential, and I think this is the what Representatives Whitsett and Berman are trying to do with their legislation, is to impo impose accountability on university actors. And I think that it sends a clear message, but more than sending a clear message, it has really powerful consequences. And I think that John Vaughn would agree with me that if a survivors know that institutional actors are going to be held accountable as enablers, not as perps, but as enablers, there's a very powerful message that's being sent to um, people who enabled Anderson and others who are, as we speak, are enabling. And I think that to, if you think about their legislation, that theme of accountability is absolutely essential. I think it's a critical, as I understand their, their effort, it's a critical piece of their effort. I would like to just jump in real quick and just say that you know the timing is imperative because every time there's a new school year, this is my thought, every time there's a new school year, there's a new opportunity for somebody to be victimized. So the time is of the essence. So Representative Berman and I are determined. Thank you, Representative. Um, we have a follow-up question from the Detroit News. Yeah, it's just um, questions for um, Amos and John. Um, when do you expect the uh, book uh, that you two are working on uh, to be published? And will there be other stories besides uh, John Vaughn's? Uh, one, yes, there will be other stories. Um, and two, Amos and I are gr aggressively uh, in the writing process that we feel should be completed within the next six to nine months. And we're looking at completing it in 2021. Um, and feel really good about um, and it will my goal is stories. that it will include other stories okay. and um, my goal is to have it come out you know I'm targeting and hopeful um, before uh, kickoff of the football season next year okay we want to thank everybody who uh, attended today and lasted through all the tech problems, everything else. Thank you very much, John Vaughn, for finding your way back to us. And thanks uh, for Professor Guerra from zooming in from, uh, from Israel and Representative Berman and Representative Whitsett. If anyone else has any questions, feel, please feel free to email me at the uh, email address I sent to you earlier for this Zoom. And otherwise, we'll conclude for today. And thank you very much.